I, I've got this slide up here to plug. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, first of all. Uh, it's, a, it's an honour to be here and, and delighted. Uh, it's, be, it's a great conference. Um, so I had this slide up to, to, to plug this uh, edited collection. I can use this, please. All right. Yeah. Um, and um, I, uh, uh, I will be drawing on some of the, the scholarship from it in my talk, so it's not uh, entirely coincidental that I have it as a first slide. But uh, Chang was, was just saying that I have an interest in happiness as well, and I co-edited a book on happiness that also came out at, at the end of last year, and I've just received a text saying that the, the Economist uh, magazine has an article on that book. So I was thinking, there's a, uh, I can plug the happiness collection as well uh, with an example of, uh, I think that must be some kind of impact or, or dissemination uh, success there. Um, so, uh, I'm, but I'm not here to talk about happiness today, uh, although that's obviously part of the, uh, uh, what it means to be a gendered person in China. I'm here to talk about uh, ma masculinities, and uh, the, uh, that dread word post-socialism <laughs> appears in the uh, post-socialist appears in the title. So uh, this paper is going to focus on middle-class uh, masculinities, which is what I've been investigating over the last several uh, years uh, in China. And uh, masculinities lens provides uh, fresh perspectives on China's middle class. I know middle class is a contested term, not least in China. So here I'm just using it as shorthand for a segment of society that includes the well-educated and relatively well-off urban professionals that I've been uh, researching. And I will consider um, the class, gender, cultural and national identity dimensions of Chinese middle class uh, masculinities through examining portrayals of masculinities in visual and media cultures and how male informants have presented their masculinities to me. So two broad patterns have, uh, well this uh, by the way is uh, from a, an, a men's magazine uh, from s several years ago, uh, one of these lifestyle magazines that uh, so, so I sort of thought it sort of captures visually the, the kind of uh, uh, visual discourse of uh, prof young professional white collar uh, men and masculinities in urban China that, that, that I look at. Two broad patterns have emerged from my analysis in the areas of gender relations, in the areas of gender relations and cultural national identity. So uh, in terms of gender relations, uh, middle class men tend to be depicted and to define themselves through expressions of freedom and equality. However, uh, while they move towards these ideals in some of their activities, they tend to act to shore up the parameters of their own gendered and class privileges as much as they can. Uh, so in this aspect, middle class men's conflicted subjectivities uh, reveal them as both conservatives and progressives. So that's, that's a quote from Mark Lichty, uh, who's done a lot of work on the middle class uh, transnationally. As for the second pattern, uh, which I'll probably talk about more today, in fact, uh, in, in both, uh, which is the, uh, the, the notion of um, national and cultural identities. Uh, at one, in, uh, sorry, the, in both discursive uh, depictions and self-presentations, I found that an aspiration to project an air of cosmopolitanism uh, does not uh, preclude a strong sense of cultural and national Chinese identity. So at one and the same time, China's middle class men appear to identify with and disidentify with images of Western, if we like, cosmopolitan or cosmopolitan masculinities. So as such, in gender relations and cultural identities, I'm arguing that my informants' attitudes can be ca characterized as uh, ambivalent. Uh, now, uh, Raymond Connell has uh, described the emergence of a me-first, materialistic, sexually permissive, transnational business masculinities of limited loyalties, which commodify men's relations with women while simultaneously proclaiming equal opportunities for women through a gender-neutral language of markets, individuals and choice. And Mark Lichty, who I just mentioned, has pointed to how the emerging global middle classes increasingly embrace uh, moral and political rhetorics of freedom, equality uh, and free trade while using their wealth to buy imagined security in gated communities. So Connell and Lichty's insights suggest patterns of discursive middle class identity formation around notions of equality, freedom and choice, which belie the ways in which middle class behaviour on the ground, uh, if you like, creates new hierarchies of gender and class. Uh, at the same time, both uh, Connell and Lichty acknowledge the, uh, cultural specificities in business and middle class identities. So, uh, notions of cosmopolitanism and ambivalence help provide useful conceptual frameworks for examining gender, class, cultural and national dimensions in middle class 
Chinese masculinities. So Kwame Anthony Appiah has written usefully of the cosmopolitan patriot, uh, a rooted cosmopolitan. The cosmopolitan patriot has his or her own sense of cultural home, yet also enjoys the differences afforded by cultural homes of others. Uh, Jérôme de Clute has developed the figure of the Chinese cosmopatriot who imbues Chineseness with a sense of cosmopolitanism and vice versa. So for de Clute, Chinese cosmopatriotism occurs in uh, three ways, cultural struggles that uh, localize globally circulating ideas and practices, uh, exemplified in Chinese hip hop, cultural criticism, that disrupts notions of cultural purity, as in the art of Xu Bing, and the playful anti-culturalism that abandons any pretensions towards cultural essences, as in Stephen Chow's Kung Fu Hustle. But cultural struggle, the first category, uh, most aptly fits the ambivalence of Chinese middle-class men's conflicted aspirations to, uh, on the one hand, global cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan ideals that include progressive gender attitudes, and on the other hand, embedded notions and practices of masculinity that perpetuate national and male chauvinisms. So Lisa Roffel has conceptualized this general phenomenon as domestication of cosmopolitanism by way of renegotiating China's, China's place in the world and gives the example of young Chinese female informants who desire to be single autonomous global consumers yet simultaneously wish to inhabit the conventional role of the respectable married women. So in the views of de Clute and Roffo, Chinese localization of globally circulating notions and practices is clearly characterized by ambivalence and contradiction. Now, the works of Homi Baba and uh, Partha Chatterjee on the formation of colonial subjectivities and the cultural sphere in the historical context in India provides a useful perspective on the formation of middle-class masculinities and claims to national cultural identities that are occurring in contemporary China. So Baba proposes that colonial uh, subjectivities are typified by a split subject that exhibits ambivalent and divided identifications, rendering the notion of pure cultural identity unsustainable. On the one hand, the colonial subject wishes to mimic the behavior and lifestyles of elite metropolitans. On the other hand, he or she also wants to forge a cultural identity that differs from the colonizers. So these tugs in con contradictory directions in the subject subjectification process reveal, uh, I quote, the boundaries of colonial discourse. Now in the current era, notions of cosmopolitanism premised on Western metrop metropolitanism rework the discourses of colonial times, um, uh, inscribing anotherness in non-Western contexts that is simultaneously desired and uh, derided. So Chatterjee points out that the search for uh, post-colonial modernity uh, inevitably uh, connects with historic struggles against um, Western modernity. So using the example of Bengal, uh, Chatterjee argues that colonized uh, non-Western elites from the mid-19th century uh, before the political challenge to imperialism asserted an inner domain of spiritual culture built on difference from the West. So key elements in the cultural sphere were the family, the position of women and national forms of literature and art which were to be wrought modern yet simultaneously had to be marked by national essence. Uh, so in the uh, semi-colonized uh, China in the second half of the 19th century uh, the earliest uh, generation of uh, uh, modernizing figures associated with the foreign learning faction, the, the Yang Wu Pai, uh, or uh, the self strengthening movement, uh, the Zichang Yundong, such as uh, uh, Zhang Guofan and uh, Li Hongzhang and uh, uh, Zhou Zhongtang Tang, simultaneously, similarly made a division between uh, spiritual and material spheres. So in this light, it's unsurprising that in post-socialist China, uh, Zhang Guofan has become a totemic model of a patriotic, well-educated Chinese man uh, based on his welcome of Western technology uh, where it strengthened the nation, but also his cultivation of a strongly Confucian moral image. So Zhang's association with the Yang Wu faction marked him as a cosmopolitan figure, cosmopolitan-like figure of his time. Uh, he was a hero of Chiang Kai-shek's uh, became a taboo figure during the high socialism of the Mao era. Since the 1980s, Zhang has been acclaimed by cultural nationalists as both an exemplary Confucian man of literary and professional achievements and moral excellence and a seminal uh, modernizer of industry and education. So a clear majority of my informants constructed part of their identity in opposition to the West uh, precisely through these kind of tropes 
uh, found in the national literary canon, the concepts from the Analects, the Tao Te Ching, classic Buddhist scriptures, and through a somewhat camouflaged patriarchy, I wonder if that's sort of patchy patriarchy, camouflage patriarchy, uh, I'm using the term here, in the family, through assumptions and uh, about the responsibilities of the virtuous wife and the good mother. Now, in the context of the cultural sphere in post-socialist China, uh, Xi Jinping's pronouncements on gender and the family exemplify the kind of ambivalence to modernity that Chatterjee outlines. Xi has stressed his commitment to gender equality before the, the UN General Assembly. At the same time, he's designated the family as the spiritual and moral foundation of Chinese civilization, calling for attention to the family, family education and family values. Zhu Zhong Jia Ting, Zhu Zhong Jia Jiao, Zhu Zhong Jia Feng and emphasizing the unique role of women in the family. She has identified their main service to the country as caring for the elderly and educating children. Uh, by describing the perfect wife as virtuous, he does this, uh, and the perfect mother as kind, uh, uh, so it's the, uh, uh, he says, Qi Xian Mu Tzu. She has reproduced the well worn trope that the stability of the household, headed by a patriarch, rests on the shoulders of the virtuous wife and the good mother. Uh, as examples of good mothers, she has cited two stories that every Chinese school child knows the devotion of Mencius's mother to her son, and General Yue Fei's mother's insistence that he defend the country rather than care for her. So she has recounted that his own mother seared the story pictured here, seared the story of Yue Fei into his memory uh, when, when he was young. And Xi's message is clear. A good mother sacrifices her own interests for those of her son. So his choice of Mencius and Yue Fei as masculine models underlies, underlines the age-old ideal that Chinese men should balance win, uh, cultural attainment, and Wu, uh, martial valor. Cam Louis' work, and also seizes the chance to laud fervent nationalism. She has emphasized the hierarchical nature of Confucian family relationships by exhorting younger brothers to respect elder brothers, uh, that's Di Gong, and all children to be filial. Uh, so his revisionist approach to com Communist Party history stresses that these very family morals were espoused and practiced by male socialist heroes such as Zhou Enlai, Zhu De, and Mao Zedong. Uh, the infusion of middle-class men's uh, cosmopolitanism uh, with Chinese characteristics has significant gender and, and class consequences. So as, as uh, Song Gang points out uh, in his chapter in the, in the book I showed earlier, the online novel turned hit TV series, Love Me If You Dare, uh, Ta Laila, Ching Bi Yan, uh, reproduces a stereotypical pattern of sexual relationships in post-Mao Chinese films through the hierarchical relationship between the globe-trotting, highly educated male protagonist and his girlfriend. Uh, the male lead is celebrated for his immense cultural and economic capital acquired through his Chinese intellectuality and work ethic, uh, which enables him to outperform Westerners, but also to dominate his relationship with his uncomplaining girlfriend. And we get a kind of sense of that in the, the sort of visual representations here. Um, the infusion of middle-class Chinese men's cosmopolitanism with Chinese characteristics has significant... Uh, I've read that already. Sorry, next paragraph is Pamela Hunt, who's here, already, who's here today uh, and has a chapter in the book. Her analysis of the renowned novelist uh, Feng Tang's work and life shows him as a modern-day Taizu, the talented scholar, open to other cultures, yet still within a long-standing male-centric tradition that objectifies women. I'm going to quote from... Pamela's uh, brilliant uh, chapter, reading his posts, Feng Tang's uh, posts on the Weibo. Uh, one cannot fail to miss a trend on his page wherein young women, and very occasionally men, post pictures of themselves posing with one or more of his books. Uh, the photos are clearly intended to be cute or even provocative with the occasional inclusion of pictures of partially nude women. They are frequently accompanied by emojis of hearts or kisses and references to Feng Tang as their dream boy. These pictures are then reposted with the by Feng with the suggestive phrase, tonight we are really enjoying ourselves. Uh, uh, Pamela concludes that the cultural cosmopolitanism of highly educated Chinese men is concomitant with and even serves to exacerbate uh, not just gender inequalities, but socioeconomic inequalities as well. Uh, now, also in the book, uh, uh, the Cosmopolitan Dream book, as Jamie Coates shows, a uh, Japan-based restaurateur turned writer, Li Xiaomu, uh, his renouncing of Chinese citizenship to become a Japanese national is part of a process that includes his espousal of democratic principles 
campaigning for the rights of sex workers, hosting meetings of Chinese democracy activists and openly criticizing China's undemocratic political system. This is all in his bid to become a, a, a Japanese politician. Uh, such examples suggest that Chinese characteristics uh, in, in sort of inverted commas, in the representations uh, and live realities of middle class Chinese masculinities are often associated with an espousal of class and gender privilege. Now, in terms of my own uh, uh, interviews, I interviewed in, 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 from between 2011 and 2014 23 Chinese men in London and Beijing, and the vast majority were highly educated professionals. Uh, the interview data shows an intertwining of cosmopolitanism, sorry, of cosmopolitan and consumerist masculinities with historically embedded discourses and the relative persistence of hierarchical intimate partner relations and gendered expectations of family roles, despite the professed adherence to gender equality uh, and a clear trend towards emotionally engaged fathering. So let me introduce you to uh, Xianyang. Uh, Xianyang's from East China, uh, tall, athletically built guy. Uh, uh, when I met him in September 2014, he was in his mid-twenties. He'd come to the UK for his undergraduate education and had completed a master's degree and subsequently had found a job with a large British computing company. Uh, early in my interview with him, Xianyang told me about his desire to find a white girlfriend in the UK, but he was having difficulty in getting one. And I asked Xian Yang, I asked him why he thought it was apparently so difficult for Chinese men to find white female partners. And he replied, uh, we have a lot of pressure, Chinese men, to offer a decent life to their partner, to our partner. So we generally need to work hard, give up some of the joys and activities uh, that we could to have more fun. We need to study and work hard. Uh, Chinese guys are considered to be responsible and loyal, responsible for taking care of others. And sometimes we give up some masculine activities like building our bodies. Um, uh, uh, and if, if, you're a, if you're a playboy, then sometimes you're attractive to those, those girls, but that's not considered to be a good thing for us. We're supposed to be studious and hardworking. So Western girls, like men who are sporty and communicative, the, the culture, our culture is slightly different. We Chinese men are not that type. Wow, so there's a lot packed into that. But his understand <laughs> his, 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 Xianyang's understanding of masculinities is clearly influenced by deep-rooted discourses of culturally determined masculinities. And he paints himself here as a particular moral subject, the hard-working, sober-minded, responsible, loyal, caring Chinese man who de deviates from the masculine norm, which he associates with sporty, articulate, fun-loving Western men. Uh, this racialized hierarchy uh, resulted, has resulted in his depiction in Chinese masculinity having relatively little attractiveness to women in his view, which was a problem that he was determined to solve. And uh, he told me that at university he'd noticed that the good looking, smart and sophisticated white girls that he, he wanted to have a girlfriend from uh, sought confident, suave, British middle class male students as boyfriends. So to develop the social skills and sartorial knowledge that he lacked, uh, in his view. Sen Yang told me he'd consulted a book recommended on a Chinese language blog, this book here, uh, <laughs> Mr. Jones' Rules for the Modern Man. So this is a book written by Dylan Jones, a cultural commentator and editor of GQ's British edition, and it proved to be the perfect guide to developing the sartorial elegance and refined manner that Sen Yang admired in the enactment of polished British middle-class masculinities. So he believed that acculturating himself to the performative standards of British middle-class men would enhance his romantic and career prospects in UK circles. And he, he set up his own blog uh, to describe his experiences. And uh, in his own words, he told me, uh, uh, two years ago, I came across this book uh, introduced by a Chinese writer, tells you everything about uh, being a gentleman, uh, how to wear a tie, wear a suit, something I didn't uh, require or know about before. Um, you know, if you Chase, uh, you can see it here. If you chase a girl or a job, you want to meet people, you want to give them a good impression. Sometimes Chinese people lack a bit in these things. He thinks the, this book is very useful. So th uh, this is nice. If I go after a girl and I have an 80% <laughs> probability of success, he's quantified it. I know how to do things that make girls remark, oh, you're a gentleman. Uh, but I think dressing is a very superficial thing. What matters more is how you think your internal content. So Nihan, he was describing it. So in that last sentence, 
a, a Xian Yang revealed his ambivalence, I feel, this is I feel, towards the modern masculinity propagated by the book and the practices of the young men at his university who looked like they'd come from the pages of the book. And as I probed more deeply into his unease, Xian Yang told me of his difficulties in building trusting relationships with white British middle class students in his classes. Uh, saying these men were all very polite, very gentlemanly, but I sometimes wondered if what they said was deep down what they really thought. I wonder, I wonder that too. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Xian Yang's suspicions about the integrity of white British, British middle class men extended to misgivings about their sexual behaviour that he found difficult to articulate and could not accept despite his desire to emulate them and which he believed contradicted the behaviour of a Chinese gentleman. So he said, appearance wise, I want to be an English gentleman, but internally I prefer to be a Chinese gentleman. Uh, lost my place now. Um, British guys dress, is this the right slide? Yes, uh, British guys dress well and are very polite. I've just read this, haven't I? Or have I? No, right. I'm now reading it. <laughs> yes, I found it. Right, okay. Thank you. <laughs> right. Uh, British guys dress well and are very, are very polite, but internally I don't think, and he's pausing here, the way they treat uh, girls and some of the things. I talked to my girlfriend. She doesn't actually like British guys. Um, she thinks some of them are polite. He's, he's, <laughs> he's got a girlfriend, uh, but uh, she wasn't white. However, uh, she, 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 she was, uh, I think, Chinese and from the Philippines, uh, from a Chinese family. But he assured me she had been educated in the West from a young age and so was very cosmopolitan, um, which is the aspiration to have a cosmopolitan girlfriend, which whiteness is the, the highest signifier of. And we see, we've seen that, you know, a Sheldon Lou's work on, on TV dramas has shown, uh, you know, like Beijing or in New York uh, has this kind of trope. So um, he, he wants to become a Chinese girl, uh, a Chinese gentleman. Um, so uh, on the one hand, he admired his uh, classmates' uh, suave demeanors. He wanted to look like them, to, be, to possess their social skills, to be as sexually attracted as they seem to be. Yet on the other hand, he had a strong sense of a cultural Chinese masculinity founded on particular moral values and practices that did not square with the masculinity projected by his classmates. So to explore this further, I asked him if, because he'd used the term Chinese gentleman in English, and I said to him, do you mean the Junzi? And he said, that is absolutely what I mean by the, the term Chinese gentleman. He said, it is the Junzi that he was referring to, a Junzi, a gentleman more internally. So this Junzi, the notion of the Junzi in Confucian, uh, discourse. So he said uh, the scholars of the Confucian school, the Ruja, were polite, they took care of the family, cared about society's problems, uh, they took care of the whole universe. Uh, I think that's the most important thing. They always considered the well-being of the whole people, regardless of nation. I don't really like the notion of nation, government party, Chinese Communist Party. Junza care more about the people uh, and focus on internal internal cultivation. This was a trope that came up with other people I spoke to as well. So a good, a, a good definition of the Junes is that they don't do immoral things when they're alone. And he said, uh, I think the basic idea combining external and internal gentlemanly characteristics works regardless of country. I don't just see myself as Chinese. I like to be a global citizen. In high school, yeah, I wrote an article, uh, I wrote an article, developed a theory to prioritize things in my mind. First thing was, I wrote I would die for Tianxia, all under heaven, then parents, then country, then my woman, and then myself. So he's, he, he, he's, he's got it all worked out. Uh, and he, 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 yeah, he sets out here a model of a cosmopolitan Junza masculinity that transcends national boundaries and concerns in its understanding of all under heaven, extending to the whole world, yet at the same time, he retains a strong sense of the distinctiveness of scholarly Chinese masculinity and its strengths. So his reconstruction of the Junza as a transnational figure forges a Chinese male cultural identity in the context of globalization. It combines the polished, urbane, external gentlemanly characteristics that he observed in his British classmates with a steadfast practice of inner cultivation 
uh, you know, sort of Xioshan, yeah, inner cultivation of good moral practices. So Xianyang thereby asserted an inner spiritual dimension to his masculinity that encompasses precisely those elements that part of Chatterjee identified as the chief concerns of post-colonial elites or semi-post-colonial elites. Paradigms from national literatures, you know, the, the Confucian annex, the family, men's relationships with their wife. So I, I think Xianyang's domestication of a cosmopolitan masculinity reveals his ambivalence and, un and unease about the masculinities of Western modernity. Now, I'm not sure if I'm going to have much time left. How much time do I have left? Um, ten, minutes or, ten minutes? Ten minutes or something? Five, ten, yeah. So, I, d I do have a, a, another... Uh, I could maybe briefly introduce you to another character then, Bradley the son of officials in his mid-twenties and a design professional who I talked to, uh, who was an admirer of Jun's masculinity as well. Uh, and uh, he told me that a Chinese gentlemanly masculinity was crucial, not only to his sense of manhood, but for the health of the Chinese nation as a whole. And Bradley had moved to the UK from South China for his secondary school education, which had forced him to reconsider his relationship with China and Chinese culture. Uh, and he identified a major problem with contemporary Chinese society in his perspective, which was the lack of a specific, of a culturally specific moral counterbalance to hyper-consumerism that had spread in recent years. So he, he, he uh, emphasized self-cultivation of a moral Junzi masculinity. Uh, life is about self-cultivation. Confucianism puts it as a cultivation of personal morals. Buddhism is more interested in personal happiness in general, which I also feel attractive to. So even with computers and whatnot, it still comes down to cultivation of personal happiness. I think that doesn't change. Yu Cho Yu, uh, this is a well-known cultural commentator, uh, kind of, I don't know how to describe this guy, he's deeply embedded in cultural narratives, culturalism or whatever, says the Junza, but very well known, prominent public intellectual or whatever, says the Junza is the cultural ideal of China, like the samurai is for Japan. China needs more self-cultivation to be taught, the attention paid to dreams, creams, designer clothes, hairstyles, doesn't make for interesting character and so self-cultivation is what's missing. So you can see how uh, uh, Bradley here is picking up ideas that are circulating in prominent public discourses and, 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 and bringing them into his conceptualization of his masculinity. Um, it led him, he, he seeks meaning in life beyond consumerism, uh, goes to Confucian and Buddhist practices of self cultivation, which he explicitly links to these national cultural identity discourses. Um, and uh, it, it's a very important uh, thing for uh, China, he claimed. Um, I'm not going to have time to go through too much. Uh, I'll just uh, say that he did link it into the political sphere. Uh, he said that the political uh, sphere in China uh, uh, it requires a kind of Confucian self-cultivation uh, 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 because of the lack of checks and balances uh, in the uh, Chinese political system, in his view, vis-a-vis -vis the Western system. So it's really drawing on this uh, age-old notion of the moral capabilities uh, and, and performance of the uh, or performativity of the, the Chinese leader. Um, right. Um, my informants um, did uh, criticize uh, Chinese, uh, British men generally. So these were principally the, inf the informants uh, living in London. These are professional Chinese men, very unhappy with British men's masculinity, particularly with regard to absent, what they, they call a, a high degree of absent fatherhood, British men not being as filial as they should be. Uh, and they contrasted this with Chinese men's acceptance in their view of responsibility for their families, especially in terms of duties of care towards their children and parents, and that uh, British men were unacceptably sexually lewd towards women in the street, in the workplace, they were prone to public drunkenness, football hooliganism, these kind of things. So I think they're, they're, they, they, my informant's views uh, cohered around notions of self-control and responsibility, uh, which they believed they possessed uh, as, as Chinese men, British men did not. So this, this kind of uh, is a reworking of historical Confucian expectations of self-restraint in men on the win literary path. You know, Cam Louise written about this, including the containment of sexual passion. Uh, it, it also uh, it, it reworks the, 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 the embedded characterization of non-Chinese people as relatively unrefined in comparison to Chinese people. So this emphasis on a distinctly Chinese approach to particularly family and gender relations uh, through concepts central to the Confucian tradition demonstrates their commitment to shaping a Chinese cultural sphere premised on difference to perceived Western values and practices. Um, emotionally engaged fatherings come in 
I'm going to say a little, just a tiny bit about this and then move to my conclusion. Yeah. Um, so, uh, in, in, in recent years, increased transnational circulation of images of emotionally expressive and caring fatherhood has come into to China. And th this is dealt with in, in, in the book as well. And, and Chinese fathers are spending more and more time with their children and, and being expressive emotionally with them. And according to uh, some research, um, uh, Lee and Jankowiak, you know, uh, they argue the stigma attached to men's performance of feminine roles in the family is fading uh, 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 and uh, it's not seen as unmanly now to be emotionally engaged with your, your child. Um, the, uh, you know, we've got TV uh, programs uh, like the ad Chinese adaptation of the Korean reality show, Dad, Where Are We Going, Baba Chunar, covering celebrity fathers and their children. And the, 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 the main fathering masculinity that won the audience's heart was this uh, sunshine man, sunshine boy, Nuan Nan, you know, warm man, model of expressive and affectionate difference, which we can see here. And... Um, uh, in the book, uh, Gung Song, uh, not Gung Song, uh, Song Lin, Lin Song has a chapter uh, talking about this uh, uh, kind of rendering of transcultural pan East Asian soft masculinity. You know, we've seen this in the Korean wave. Uh, 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 that's prominent, but uh, Lin Song demonstrates that the show also reproduces conventional gendered hierarchies in its association of the masculine with competition, achievement, and public space, and the feminine with domestic space and care, and also in the relationships it, it depicts between father and, and daughters, uh, where it shows an emphasis on uh, paternal authority. So we can see that... Um, uh, despite the turn to transnational models of tender fathering in this hugely popular show, historically inflected cultural forms of masculinity continue to shape depictions of fathering and gendered expectations of girls' life roles continue to define and limit female agency in ways that echo biomedical and historical discourses of gender uh, difference. Now, um, I just found that uh, there's a persistence of patriarchy or patchy patriarchy or whatever is still... Uh, uh, um, uh, there, in, uh, certainly in the discourses and in, in my discussions with informants. And I just wanted to uh, raise the research by Xia Zhang in the, in, in, that's in the book as well, um, uh, who did a digital ethnography of US Chinese chat forums, which revealed well educated Chinese men's ambivalence towards gender equality between intimate partners. Zhang's analysis shows that US based postgraduate Chinese male students depict Chinese men who marry white American women as super masculine, right? Uh, so this is the desire for the white woman because they've domesticated the much desired modern and beautiful for another. But at the same time, affluent female uh, Chinese undergraduates are using the derogatory term Beime uh, Weiswanan, the uh, North American despicable man to deride Chinese male postgraduates from less well-off backgrounds uh, as, as um, this is a sort of rendering, as unmasculine because they don't possess the wealth, muscularity and social polish of the, the masculine ideal. And uh, I, uh, I did find in my informants, I just mentioned very briefly before going to my, oh, no, I should mention that slide uh, there, Peter Chan's hit film, American Dreams in China. Uh, uh, also, very, uh, 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 yeah, it was a big uh, hit in China, uh, but it, it, it did um, uh, talk about the dangers of independent-minded foreign women. So one of the, in a widely circulated clip, Wang Yang, one of the three co-founders of the, the school that is you know, based on New, or New, Orient New Oriental, Xindongfa, one of the, uh, he, he tells his friends, to avoid women with too many of their own ideas because of his own experience of being dumped by an American exchange student girlfriend during his college days. So you can see these kind of um, uh, hierarchies uh, or patriarchal inflections that are still there. And I'm just about to coming to my conclusion, if that's all right. Uh, I did, my informants also uh, came up with uh, similar messages of ambivalence that they were progressive and wanted to be tendered fathers, but at the same time they were concerned about what they called female chauvinism, the rise of female chauvinism and women's rise in men's decline. I think we're all familiar with these kind of anxious masculine tropes. So to come to my conclusion, 
contemporary Chinese middle class masculinity is a bricolage of cosmopolitan and historically embedded elements. Emotionally engaged feathering has been incorporated relatively smoothly into Chinese masculinity because it signifies a modern masculinity without fundamentally threatening the embedded patriarchal hierarchies of the Chinese cultural sphere. Spousal equality, however, does threaten them. And uh, educated Chinese men's cosmopatriot, cosmi, cosmopatriotic domestication of aspects of Western business masculinities and their cultivation of embedded Confucian masculinities constitutes, I argue, a strategic effort to insert themselves more advantageously into local and global power relations of gender, class and, na class and nation. Uh, in this light, um, well, I, okay, I'll quote uh, Ying Jiaguo on this, who says that uh, while some contemporary proponents of Confucianism may generally believe in its magic power to solve the world's problems, like uh, uh, Shenyang did, uh, their enthusiasm, enthusiasm for it can also be seen as a hegemonic practice calculated to reinforce the discursive formation of Confucian values and thereby empower themselves in the contest for inf influence and control over national identity in the future di directions of the nation. Modernization narratives argue that modern societies are typified by the disappearance of tradition and progressive change resulting in greater individualisms. Uh, social equality and, and democracy. Yet the evidence, you can see I'm a, a, a child of Harriet Evans' uh, academic, um, academic uh, 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 views uh, on modernization. Yet the evidence shows the continuing significance of historical modes of masculinity for Chinese men today and the persistence of patriarchal hierarchies in contemporary gender relations. So these findings undermine modernization narratives that posit China's globalization process as inevitably resulting in the jettisoning of traditional gender identities and practices, the disappearance of gender discrimination. The role of Chinese middle class men in perpetuating class, gender and other hierarchies complicates professional Chinese men's claims to moral integrity, undermines the idea that the middle class is inherently progressive, challenges the notion that economic development unproblematically delivers uh, social democratization. Last slide, last paragraph. Um, Colonial, nationalize, colonial nationalisms are derivative discourses, according to Chatterjee. As the post-colonial nation, or in China's case, post-socialist nation, we can debate that, both desires and rejects an imaginary of the West, as do the subjects within it. This is particularly evident in the modern masculinity struggled for by middle-class men, as it's the highly educated class that acts as a localizing conduit of foreign cultures and under the unequal terms of colonialism and post-colonialism are caught between notions of two cultures and feel alienated from both. So Baba's notion of ambivalence, Chatterjee's, Chatterjee's concept of the cultural sphere suggests that the conflictedness of Chinese middle-class men towards cosmopolitan ideals is part of a wider phenomenon of educated elites in non-Western countries defining their national culture and masculinity in distinction to perceived Western formulations such as individualized choices of gender and sexual identities. So envisioning, envisioning Chinese masculinities as ambivalent, ambiguous, and contradictory helps facilitate a clearer view of China's post-socialist modernity, or whatever we choose to call it, the context in which these masculinities have emerged as inherently the context this is, is inherently ambivalent and torn. The latest iteration, as it were, of a process that began in the middle of the 19th century. In other words, ambivalent masculinities point to wider societal ambivalences. It could be argued that China's post-socialist modernity is constituted upon ambivalence, ambiguity and contradiction. Is China socialist or capitalist? Is it westernizing or Confucianizing? Is it aspiring to global hegemony or peaceful coexistence? Those struggling for gender and sexual equality in China face the difficult task of making their arguments in the face of masculinist, masculinist national cultures premised on cultural sphere difference from the West, particularly in the realm of family and gender relations. So it remains to be seen whether the Chinese cultural sphere and its masculinities can be re-envisioned in ways that free them from this binary opposition to perceived Western cultural norms. Uh, thank you. <laughs>